sorry, my name is today. I'm going to talk about uh, the macroeconomic and fiscal implications of population aging. And before I start, I should warn you that this presentation will be more about asking questions rather than giving easy answers. Uh, okay, let's have a look at what's going on in the world in terms of population aging. A simple, easy indicator that we could use to measure the population aging is just the size of the people aged 60 or above in, in, the, in the economy. And in the first chart, you see that the, here the black bars show the number of people aged 60 or above in the world. And from 2000s here to 2050, you see that this number will almost triple. And most of the elderly people will be residing in the less developed regions. But the second graph shows something different, that when you think about the share of the aged population in total population, the problem is more substantial for the developed countries. The, the share of the people aged 60 and above in developed countries will increase close to, from close to 20% in the population in 2000 to about more than 30% by 2050. Uh, but the question is, is this, is this good or bad? This might be a sign of a actually very healthy economy, meaning that the, we have more elderly people because people are living longer and healthier lives thanks to some advances in technology and better life standards. And this is exactly what happened in the last few centuries. When you look at here, this is the proportion of uh, people aged 60 and above in the society, in the world, no, sorry, this is for England. And from beginning of the 19th century to the end of it, there's a huge jump. So people started living longer and that's accompanied by this expectation of life at birth. <coughs> like in, in England, a child born uh, in 1830s were expected to live on average up to 40 years in 19, 1830s. But now it's more than 70, right? And what was the reason for that? The right hand side graph shows that the survival rate increased. In Let's see, the lower bar here, the, sorry, the line here, shows the date 1541. And for that date, for every 1,000 child, child that were born, more than 400 of them died before they reached to uh, age 20. But what happened within time is that that curve shift, shift upwards. That means that the mortality rates started decreasing fast. And by the end of the, let's say, the, by now, we have, we have really, really small ratios of mortality in the world compared to four or 500 years ago. So obviously, this is, this is not a bad thing, right? We, we wouldn't complain about uh, not dying early. As, a, as the indi individual who dies or this whole society, you wouldn't like your dad to die at 35. But the problem is that the story is different now. The life expectancy at birth still improves. But the pace of it is a lot smaller compared to what happened like, 300 years ago. So we're still expected each generation that follows us will live a little bit longer. Uh, that's because of the longevity. Like each individual lives longer, plus the mortality is less than before. But here's a unique, unique observation that we didn't have uh, as this much before is the the, what we could call the baby bust, the fertility rates decreased substantially. In 1950s, each, each woman on average would have about five births in the world. But now what you have is that it's less than three, and by the end of the 2050s, it's going to be even less than two, which is, which is smaller than the average replacement rate, right? Your, father and your uh, mother will have less than two kids. For each two individuals, you will have less than two kids. This means that this population size will shrink. So why is it important? What's the difference between 
an aging population that ages because of increasing longevity versus an aging population because we have less less growth. To understand that, we are going to use a simple simple indicator. Uh, you could actually start from this picture here, so that explains almost everything. This old age dependency ratio shows the number of people aged 65 and above over the number of people aged between 15 and 64. 15 and 64 is special because it's the working age. People work usually when they are between 15 and 64 and they don't after that. And this indicator shows how many, ignoring the baby over there, how many elderly person that doesn't participate in the labor force you will have per worker in the society. Obviously, if this number is high, that means that each worker will have to support more and more elderly people. Uh, okay, the difference between the aging society because you have, because people live longer is that when people live longer, you will have this numerator increasing because the elderly people will stick around and you will have more of them within time. So that will increase the old age dependency ratio, it's kind of bad. But when you have both increasing longevity and decreasing uh, fertility, what happens is that your numerator increases, but at the same time, your denominator decreases, even pushing the old age dependency ratio further. So, and what does that mean in terms of the macroeconomic implications? We'll have the old age dependency ratio skyrocketing in the future, and that's going to affect the economy in the way that I'm going to explain now. So in a typical economy, we can approximate what's being produced the, uh, of goods and services, let's say, with a technology production function here. And it has three components, the technology, capital, and labor, AKL. Uh, we do not quite know well what happens to the technology, the total factor productivity, when you have an aging population. We have some idea, but we do not understand it completely. So I'm not going to particularly talk about that. Uh, capital, capital is important in this case, but given the time constraints, I'll more focus on the labor side. So let's let's show you some algebra just for fun. Oh, you, if you're an economics major, you're gonna see more, more of this in coming years. So don't you, you better get used to this. So I can just divide this. Why was the output right? The output that we produce. I can just divide it with uh, labor to find the output per labor. And if you already took a macroeconomics class, you know this, but if you haven't, then you will learn that in an economy, output is equal to income. So output per labor is actually equal to income per worker. All right? So this left-hand side is income per worker. And this is a simple ratio. I can divide with any number except zero, both sides, and that will be the same ratio. I divide with population. So what you have here is that output per capita, or income per capita, all right? Income per person in the society, over, you have this labor over population. This is the labor force participation, all right? And this ln, if you haven't seen this yet, is logarithm. I just take the logarithm of both sides and rearrange it. And what I get is something more intuitive. This says, Income per capita in an economy is equal to income per worker. Income per worker is an indicator of productivity. All right. If you are you have more productive workers, then your income per worker will increase. So your income per capita in the economy is equal to productivity plus the labor force participation. And if you just rewrite this equation for the following year and subtract them, what you get is this equation here. It's actually pretty simple intuitively. It says that the, the growth rate in income per capita in an economy is equal to growth rate in total factor productivity or labor productivity plus the change in the labor force participation. So that means that if you are very productive, you will have more income to spend, but if the labor force participation affect how much money you can spend in any economy. 
But how, how big is this impact? How, how important is the labor force participation? Uh, this experiment by the Nick Bloom of the, the uh, Harvard University investigate that. And this is a very simple exercise. I don't know why this is fine. Okay. Uh, so this, what this exercise, exercise does is we look at the OECD economies between 1960 and 2005, and we just get the productivity growth for those economies. And then we get the labor force participation growth in those economies. And also we get the income per capita growth. But instead of using the labor force participation between 1960 and 2005, we are using, we are replacing that with our projections for the future. So the question is, what if the OECD economies actually had the labor dynamics that they are going to have in the future in the past? All right. So we are replacing the 2005-2050 labor force dynamics into the past data to see how would the world look like if we actually have this tra demographic transition. And the results are quite striking. If the labor force dynamics or the population dynamics had no effect in the economies, then what you would see is that all the economies will lie above those 45 degree line. But they don't, except one country. And this happens to be my own country, uh, Turkey. I don't know why they always stand on this side of the line, but <laughs> uh, on average, this economy is actually would grow 0.7 percentage point less than what they actually did. All right, let's say for United States, it would grow on average every year 0.7 percentage point less if we had the projected population dynamics. Is this a big number? Is this a small number? Just to give you an idea, in 2005, the United States per capita income was for about $42,000. And if we had the future uh, demographic transitions in the past, then it would be not $42,000, but $32,000. Is this important? I wouldn't personally like to lose $10,000 a year, right? Okay. So th that was the macroeconomic implication of the aging society. But it also has fiscal implications. Just think about this, the difference between the per worker income and per capita income. A careful audience, anybody, in, in, anybody careful in the audience would say that, look, you are telling us something like apples and oranges. You're telling us that per capita income would be less, but you're not telling us that per worker income, what if the workers do not share their income with the rest of the population? Okay, in 50 years, we will have some workers, they will be productive, the productivity growth keeps uh, continuing, but there will be a big chunk of elderly people, what if the workers say, okay, look, this is our earnings, and this is what yours, and just, we, we, are, in a, we are not necessarily in a communist country, we don't have to share this with you, right? So you work, I work, this is my share, this is your share. But actually that's not, that doesn't only happen in the communist countries, even in the non-communist countries, there are ways the elderly people have claims on the output in the economy. If you are an open economy, completely open economy, which means that the interest rates are determined globally. And if you have no intergenerational linkages, which means that there is no bequests from your parents don't leave any money to you, or you don't support them when they're older, then it's fine. The workers don't need to share, and the aging population or lower fertility does not affect who consumes what. But when you have actually a not open economy, or not as much open economy, which applies to all countries, even the United States is not perfectly open. The savings, domestic savings, and the investments are very correlated. So if you don't have a completely open economy, or when you have a social security system, an unfunded social security system like the pay-as-you-go, which pretty much all the countries in the world have, at least uh, to an extent, then this, the picture is different. The current workers, which means us and you probably, if you're working, 
we do have claims on the future output. When we get older, we are going to say that, look, I contributed to this social security system, and now it's my time to get my pension benefits. And what will the next generation tell us depends on what the policymakers change in the policies. So the current workers will have claims, and the government implicitly guarantees us that when we work today, we are going to be able to get our pension benefits in the future. And if the contributors to the social security system gets less and less, we have less people contributing because of the uh, demographic <coughs> dynamics, but more people asking for money as their pension benefits, then what will the government do? That's a good question. We don't know. We need to think about that. That will increase the pressure on government to address this problem because the, the money that comes in in this picture the money that comes in the pay-as-you-go system will not be able to finance the money that goes to the beneficiaries. We don't quite exactly have projections for every single country using the same methodology in the future, like which countries will face the most pressure, but there are some usual suspects. And the darker means bad, uh, worse. And here, you see that the major European economies already have more than 10% of their GDP spent for the, uh, the pension benefits. This means that 10% of the output that the workers currently produce are already taken away from them and given to the elderly people as their pensions. And in the future, this will increase. And then there is the second channel of pressure on the government's fiscal budget, which is the health expenditures. This graph on the left-hand side shows you that the elderly people spend a lot more money for their health than the younger people. One reason is because uh, they get more sick, but there's a caveat here. I'll tell that in the end of this slide. So on average, you see that those older than 75 spans almost about like six times more than those who are between 34 and 44. So as you have more and more of the elderly people in the society, you would expect the healthcare expenditures to skyrocket in the economy. And who pays for that? Some of them are private, some of them we pay out of our own pocket, but most of them goes to the, goes to the social security system. And the caveat that uh, I mentioned in this graph. Any, any idea on that? Do, do you see some sort of not, it's not 100% logically consistent here? Because most of the expenditures that we incur for health purposes happens just before we die. All right? We go to hospital, we have a serious disease, we have to stay there for maybe months, right? So that's the time when actually we spend most of the money. And if you have people living longer and longer, that doesn't mean they, whether they live up to 100 or they live up to 50, they die, right? So in the last, last year of life, their life, they will still uh, incur a lot of uh, expenditures. But there is also a caveat to that caveat, which is the long-term care. As people get older, they might have longer spans of uh, uh, time where they need help to achieve live, right? So you, you maybe you cannot move, you're not mobile. Some you need some help to take care of you. Alright. So these are basically pretty much the ch channels where the government will face uh, <coughs> pressure. Based on these observations, what, what can the government do? What can the policymakers do? I thought I was going to use this cute picture here when I talked about the aliens investing in the open or closed economies, but then I realized this, this fits better in the policymakers discussion. So there are, it seems like there are several several things the governments can do. There are several candidates on the table. But we don't have a silver bullet. There is no one shot solution. One option is to encourage immigration. Perhaps this would recover or fill the gap that was created by lower fertility by getting further away from force. But the problem is that the low fertility is a permanent problem now. It's not going to come back. The women will not start bearing more and more child in the future. 
that's here to stay. If you allow a one-time wave of immigration, that might provide some relief for a while, but after a while, those immigrants also will retire and they will also ask for their pension benefits. So a one-time uh, increase in immigration is not a permanent solution. How about we increase the retirement age? That, sound, that seems like it's a feasible option because originally when the social security systems were invented, uh, people lived a couple of years after they retired. Like three years, four years, and that was the time they had pension benefits. But now, recently, people live up to maybe like 85 or 90, right? It's not unusual to see people living up to 90, but they retire around 63, 64. So they have pretty much 25, 30 years of life without working, but getting paid through the workers of current generation. So perhaps that can be uh, adjusted a bit. I don't favor it, I don't suggest it, but this is an option that the governments think. The problem is that it's not politically very, very easy to do that. You don't want to be the government or you don't want to be the political party who, during the election campaign, say that, hey, I'm going to make you work longer. It's not a, it's not a very attractive uh, uh, case. How about reducing the old age pension benefits, which means that the salaries you get after you retire, that can be reduced, or increasing the payroll taxes, so those who work now can contribute more so that there's less mismatch between the contributions and benefits. Uh, again, this is also not very politically attractive. Also, there are some intergenerational equity concerns. Let's say we don't do anything now, but we plan to increase the payroll taxes 30 years later. This is, this is unfair for those who are born tomorrow and who will be working in 30 years. So for the sake of current generations, benefit, we are taxing the future generations more. <coughs> well, future generations do not have lawyers now to defend them, so this is kind of an unfair situation. And the opposite, if you start, if you start taxing every, everybody now, if you start reducing the pension benefits now, there is the problem that the future generations will be richer than us, all right, because the productivity grows. And what we are doing is, while we are relatively poorer compared to future generations, we are taking all the burden on our shoulders. Is it, is it really sensible? Why don't make the richer people pay a little bit more in the future? That's also an option, but again, uh, a lot of discussions need to go into that. And how about gradually shifting toward, towards the mixed pension systems, which means that not only the current contributions finance the current benefits, but also when you work, you save some money, you invest in some, uh, some other uh, financial assets, and when you retire, you get that money back. So your money does not finance the current pensioners, but your money is invested in some way. Uh, many countries are doing this. It's increasingly becoming a more feasible option. Uh, but again, the shift, shift requires some political will. Perhaps based on the relative uh, advantages and costs of each option, perhaps the solution is a, is a weighted mix of all the options on the table, and based on the country specifics, then the governments will try to optimize their solution based on the available options. And finally, uh, I just want to finish with a quote from Alan Greenspan. I won't make any further comments on that. Thank you.